In addition to the list class we've spent far too long on, the system.collections.generic namespace provides a number of other useful classes. For example, the dictionary class maps keys to values. And retrieval in this class is almost 01, which means if you increase the size of the dictionary, retrieval time doesn't go up with the size of the dictionary. The dictionary is stored internally as a hash table, and although that may not mean much at this point, it does indicate that retrieval is very fast. Sorted dictionary and sorted list classes map sorted keys to values. The dictionary class isn't in order. If you need a dictionary that maintains its items in sorted order, you'll need to use one of the sorted dictionary or sorted list classes, and we'll describe the difference between their behaviors a little later on. If you care, they differ because of the way they store their data internally. The queue class provides first in and first out access to items. It adds a somewhat arbitrary abstract layer on top of the normal list so that you can control the order in which things go in and out of the class. The same with the stack class. It provides first in, last out access to items. In some situations, you need some help maintaining the order of items in your list, and these classes take care of that for you. Let's start by looking at a dictionary. Do you need key-based lookup with nearly instantaneous retrieval? If so, the dictionary class is a good choice. Each entry includes a key that uniquely identifies a value. Now, one of the drawbacks of this class is each key has to be unique. So if you need some way to look things up where you'll have multiple instances of the same key value, you'll need to think about it. But here's a tip. If you need a data structure that allows you to have multiple values with the same key, you'll need to rethink this, perhaps. Imagine a postal code lookup. Given the postal code, you need to find the city and the region. Now imagine there's going to be 100,000 of these in the US, so how do you find them quickly? One way is to create a dictionary. Load them all into the dictionary, and given a postal code, you can quickly find the city and the region associated with it. Now instead of storing those in a database, which you could do, you could store them in this dictionary and do it much quicker. On a website, for example, you may not want to have to go look up in a database the postal code to find the region you're looking for. You would get better performance by storing them in memory and not having to go do a database lookup for each query. Now let's review some of the issues. Every key has to be unique in a dictionary. If you attempt to add multiple keys with the same value, the dictionary class raises an exception. The dictionary size grows automatically. Although it uses an array internally, just like list, you don't have to think about it. We'll never think about it. As you add items to the dictionary, the class maintains its internal array, growing it as it needs to. Keys are hashed for storage. Now a hashing algorithm is an algorithm that takes any value and converts it into some sort of integer. The more unique that integer value is, the better the dictionary is able to store the data. Now every object in .NET provides a method that returns its hash code. There's a get hash code method on the base system.object class. Unfortunately, the system.object class's get hash code method doesn't do a very good job of providing unique integer values. So if you're going to add objects to a dictionary, you may want to ensure that they provide their own get hash code method. For objects you don't create, it's not a problem. But for your own classes, you'll most likely want to add your own get hash code method that overrides the base object class's get hash code method and provide your own way of calculating an integer that represents the data in your class. We'll see an example later on. Keys are unchangeable. Once you've added a key value pair to the dictionary, you can't have any code that changes the key. Because if you did, now that key would be associated with the wrong place in the hash table, and things would get confused. So once you add a key value pair to the dictionary, you really can't change the key. Searches are nearly 01. What that means is that the size of the hash table, the size of the dictionary, doesn't really modify the length of time it takes to find things. 
it's a very fast lookup. Of course, the more unique the hash codes are, the faster the lookup is going to be. The more collisions there are, and the dictionary has an internal algorithm it uses for placing values that have unique keys but non-unique hash codes, it does some sort of collision lookup, but that adds time to the searches. So the more unique the hash code, the better the searches are going to be. Key objects must implement I equatable. We'll use strings and numbers and simple values for our keys, and they all implement I equatable. If you create a class and use it as a key, it has to implement I equatable so the dictionary can find and compare key values. The order of retrieval is indeterminate in a dictionary. You don't really know what order you'll get things out if you ask for all the keys or all the values. If you care about the order, you need to use a different data structure. Let's try a demonstration which shows off the dictionary class. I'll choose option G, Test Dictionary, and we'll walk into this procedure. We'll start by creating a new dictionary, and when you create a new generic dictionary, you have to specify the type you'll use as the key and the type you'll use as the value. Here I'm using writer as the value and string as the key. So I can add items. I've got to specify both things when I add them. The add method requires me to do that. I specify a string value as the key and a writer as the value. So in each case, I'll add my items. That's one way to do it. You can also take advantage of the fact that the dictionary class allows you to add the writer just by specifying its index. Here, my writers, Brian R, creates the key value right then. We can then assign a value to it by saying it equals new writer and specify the content of the writer. So that added a new writer without having to explicitly call the add method. Choose which way you like to do it, it doesn't really matter. You can also use this syntax for modifying the value associated with a key. I said you can't change the key, that's true. But for a given key, you're perfectly welcome to change the value, and you could do it using syntax like that. You can retrieve the keys collection from the dictionary, and it's just a collection, it's a generic list, and we can retrieve the value here and display it, and we see our list of keys. Here, they appear pretty much in the order they were added. I don't think we can guarantee that's the case, however. Down here, we'll retrieve the values, and retrieve the values in the order in which they were added as well. In general, you shouldn't count on the order of items in the keys or values collection from the dictionary. Now to retrieve items, it's pretty easy. I'll set my key to find to be an empty string so we can loop around a couple times, and I'll create a value variable to hold the writer, and it'll be nothing for now. And let's enter a key to find, and we'll keep looping until we stop entering one. Okay, so I'll enter a key. I'll enter M chip. Now our code is going to call the tryGetValue method of the dictionary class. The tryGetValue method is a nice thing. It's like try parse for integer. It says, I'm going to attempt to find this key. If I find that key, I'll return true and place the value in this variable, which is passed by reference. If I don't find the value, I'll return false. So if tryGetValue returns true, then I'll display the value we found. Let's try it. I enter M chip, and I get a result back, and we can see that I got Mary is from Florida. That's the two string method result for M chip's value. Let's try it again. Enter a key. Let's try one that isn't there. I'll try M chop. Try get value fails, and we display nothing at all. Okay. Press enter this time to stop trying. Okay. Now, let's try adding a writer that already exists. All right, let's add another writer with ID Ken G. I think that's already in there. So I'll try to add, inside a try catch block, a new writer, Carl Eng from New Jersey, with the same ID as the current 
K-E-N-G in there. And this, of course, must fail. It fails because you can't have two items with the same key in the same dictionary. And of course, that's what we see. An item with the same key has already been added. All right, let's remove some writers. We'll try the same thing again. I'll get a value from the user, enter a key to remove. Let's enter remove m chip. I'll first check to see if my writers, the dictionary, contains the key, which is the key I entered. So the contains key method returns true if the key you've entered exists within its collection of keys. It obviously did. All right, and let's remove it now. You can remove a key, of course, that will also remove the corresponding value from our dictionary. And what's remaining right now? Remaining are those four items. Let's pick another one. Let's remove our green. Of course, that key exists, so remove that one. And we now have three items left, and so on. Let me enter, enter, and we're done here. OK. So we've seen a number of the various methods of the dictionary class. Next, we'll try a couple of other collection classes. The dictionary class doesn't provide for any ordering of its data. If you need to iterate through the keys in a specific order, you need to use the sorted dictionary or sorted list classes. These classes aren't identical, and you need to understand when to use each of them. First, let's compare their memory considerations. The sorted list uses less memory than does a sorted dictionary containing the same data. So if memory is your only issue, sorted list is the answer. Think about insertion issues. If the data you're adding is already sorted, adding it to the sorted list is more efficient. So memory is better with sorted list, and inserting data that's already sorted is better with sorted list. But if the data isn't sorted, and isn't most data not sorted, adding it to the sorted dictionary is more efficient. So if that's your goal, you may be better off with the sorted dictionary. In terms of key and value retrieval, the sorted list is faster retrieving values from both the keys and the values properties, because it maintains those all the time. The sorted dictionary must regenerate these on demand, so it's slower. I know there's a lot of things to consider, but you'll have to think how you're using these two classes and consider what works best for your situation. In our example, it's better to use the sorted dictionary class because we'll be adding data that isn't already sorted. Let's try an example. To demonstrate the sorted dictionary class, I'll choose option H. And this demonstration actually represents a a very common computer science homework assignment, which is this. I'm going to take a text file, and I'm going to parse it by words. And I'm going to add each word to a dictionary and keep count of how often each word appeared. When I'm done, I'll print the list in sorted order, displaying each word and its count. OK. Well, here I'll ask the user for a file name, assuming we want to use my fake latin.txt file, which I've created, contains a bunch of fake Latin words. Since I didn't enter anything, we'll use the default, which is that fake latin.txt. I'm going to create a sorted dictionary. And when I create a sorted dictionary, I have to supply the type for the key, string, and the type for the value, which is a text data instance. Text data is right here. And text data includes a public string, which is the word we found, and a public count, which is the number of times we found it. In the constructor, you pass in the word, and I store it into that variable. And I also initialize count to be 1. Now, in this class, if I didn't override get hash code, we would be using the get hash code method of the base object class, which doesn't do a very good job of coming up with random hash codes. On the other hand, if we override the get hash code method and create our own, we can do a better job. We're going to count on the string classes get hash code method. Value is a string. Its get hash code will use the string class's get hash code method, which guarantees that for a unique string, you get a unique hash code. 
which guarantees for us in our dictionary that every entry will have a unique hash code which will give us the best possible performance. Also, we'll later need to display each value in the dictionary, so I've supplied a toString method which overrides the object class's toString method to display here the count and the value of each word in the dictionary. That's what we'll be placing in the dictionary. All right, we're going to do this by calling the parse file method down below. Well, let's step into the parse file method. This one's going to return a sorted dictionary back, so it first creates that sorted dictionary it will use to keep track of the words. All right, we're going to read all text from the file name and place that into a string. There it is, a bunch of gibberish that looks like Latin. I've created a string that corresponds to the letters we'd like to use to parse the text. Space, comma, parentheses, brackets, braces, forward slash, backward slash, colon, and question mark, and so on. And what we'll do is use the string.split method, converting that string into a character array. That's how the split method works. And it will return back to me an array of strings, all split up. 268 words with some repetitions. You can see this empty string appears a number of times. Okay, for each word in that collection of words, I'm going to check. Does the list contain the word? If so, we'll do some things. I'll come back to that later. If not, what do we do? Well, certainly the first word isn't in there yet. So we'll create a new instance of the text data class, passing in the word, which was lorem. And the constructor is going to create the instance and set the count to 1. And now we'll add, using lorem as the key and our text data object as the value, we'll add this to our list. There we go. We'll repeat this for every word we find. Let me run full speed until I find a word that's already in the list. Here I found an empty string. It must already be there. And I'd like now to increment its count. So I retrieve the value from the sorted dictionary and store it into a variable called data. And I now increment the count, which is currently 1. I'm going to set it to 2. We don't have to put it back. It's not like we removed it from the dictionary. We just got a reference to it. We incremented its count, and now we continue on. When we're done, we come back to our original procedure. We'll be able to retrieve the values collection from that sorted dictionary and display it in the console window. I can remove that breakpoint, let it rip. And you see here in the output 105 different words sorted alphabetically by the word along with the count, the number of times each one appeared. The empty string appeared 72 times, and all the words appeared 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times within that random gibberish that looked like Latin. So you can use a sorted dictionary for this sort of thing, where you care about the order of the output and you want the fastest possible retrieval within the collection class. You'll find two other interesting classes within the system.collections.generic namespace, Q and Stack. Each one of these contains an internal array, and that array is abstracted in such a way that the class handles data input and retrieval differently. The stack adds and removes items from the same end and provides first in, last out behavior. The queue adds items at one end, it's in quotes because there's no end, it's all just a, a mental thing, and removes from the other. That gives a first in, first out behavior. The stack provides three basic operations. Push adds a new item to the stack. Imagine the stack is growing down. You've pushed item 1, item 2, and item 3. You can push item 4, and it will go at the end. Pop removes the top item. So here, we've just pushed item 4 onto the stack. Popping an item from the stack removes item 4 from the stack and leaves us again with item 1, 2, and 3. Peek is a method that just investigates the top item. It would retrieve for us information about that top item without removing it from the stack. The queue has a set of different operations. Enqueue adds an item to the end. So here we've already enqueued 
item one, item two, item three. And if we NQ item four, it adds it to the end. DQ removes an item from the front. The first item to be DQ'd will be item one in this case, because it's at the front of the queue. You can also peek in a queue to investigate the front item without removing it, without DQing it from the queue. Let's look at an example that demonstrates these simple behaviors. I'll select option I to test a stack first. And here we're going to take several riders, and I've put the numbers within the item so we can tell what order they've gone in. I'll create four new riders, and then I'll create a stack. I have a stack named Rider Stack of Rider, and I'm going to push each rider one at a time onto the stack. Now, you can also fill the stack by creating any I enumerable data structure and passing that to the constructor of the stack. Here is another line of code which creates the same exact stack. Now, let's peek at the top of the stack. We pushed four items onto the stack. Andy, Ken, Mary, Doug. What is peek going to show us? Peek should show us the last item added to the data structure. In this case, that should be Doug. Okay, we're now going to enumerate the stack non-destructively because we can. The class implements I enumerable. Interesting, the comment says a Q class. What this indicates is the Q and the stack are so similar that I sort of copied and pasted and made a copy-paste error here. Okay, so we can display the list. What that means is Display list works on anything that implements I enumerable. Since stack implements I enumerable, you can just loop through all the items in the stack if you want, but that spoils the point. If you're going to loop through all the items in the stack, why use a stack in the first place? What you really want to do is push and pop things from the stack. I've already shown how to push items onto the stack. You can also pop items from the stack by saying while the count property returns a value greater than one, pop each item from the stack and display it on the screen. So if I pop one, I've popped Doug. He was the last one added. It's kind of like the hiring and firing habits at most companies. The last person hired is usually the first one let go. So here, we retrieve the items from the stack in the opposite order from which we added them. We pushed Andy, then Ken, then Mary, then Doug. We popped them in the opposite order, Doug, then Mary, then Ken, then Andy. Let's try the same thing now, the same sort of example, with a Q. That's letter J. And here, we'll create four writers, and I'm going to create a Q and NQ each writer. They go in in the same order I NQ them. Another alternative is to create an array or anything else that implements I enumerable and just pass that as a parameter to the constructor. We get the same exact behavior. You can call the peak method of a queue and you'll get the item that's in the front. For a queue, that's the first item you added, so that should be Andy. Just like a stack, the Q class implements I enumerable, so you can treat it as a list. So here, we dumped each item out. We didn't remove it, we just displayed it. If you want to work with the Q as it was intended, you would NQ and DQ items in the same order. So here, as I loop through the items, I will DQ each item and they'll come out in the same order they were added. So we should see here, Andy, then Ken then Mary, then Doug. So we get things out in the same order we put them in. That's the point of a queue. Suppose you need a collection class that provides one or more of these features. Custom validation, so that your class could reject additions that didn't meet specific criteria. Factory methods. These are methods that allow a class to create an instance of itself or some other object. So that you could, rather than adding something to your class, you could just say, okay class, add one yourself, and it would do it. Many classes provide this functionality built into the .NET framework. Add range capabilities. So that you can add a group of values to a collection. 
At this point, you can only add a range of values to a generic list. But what if you wanted a dictionary that allowed you to add a range of values all at once? Maybe you want the ability to load and save the contents of your collection to disk so that you could save it today, load it back tomorrow, and have the exact same contents in the list. None of the collection classes provide that. Maybe you need event handling so that if someone adds an item to your list, for example, you raise an event so some consumer could keep track of additions to your collection. Maybe you want some sort of caching so you have some sort of delayed fetching of data. You could have a generic collection that would load data from disk but do it in a background thread maybe so that you didn't tie up the main thread waiting for that data to load. Except for specific cases, none of the built-in collection classes provide these capabilities, and none of them certainly have all of them. If you need to, you can create your own collection, and it seems like it would be a lot of work. Don't despair, however, because creating your own collection class is very easy. All you have to do is inherit from one of the classes in system.collections.objectModel and you have the basis for almost all the work required to build your own collection. The collection class provides a base class for any generic collection and that's the one we'll use in our demonstration. The keyed collection class provides a base class that's a hybrid between a list and a dictionary in which you store the keys within the values themselves. It's a very highly specialized collection and makes it easy for you to create your own dictionaries if you want. There's the read-only collection. It's a base class for a read-only collection in which you can't add or remove items. Often you'll want to provide a read-only wrapper around some other kind of collection and you would use this as the base class if you wanted to. So let's examine a scenario. I want to have a collection that contains writer objects. It needs to be able to save its state so that I can add writers, save the thing, load it back up tomorrow and have the exact same writers in there. I need to be able to add new writers given their name and their home state strings without having to create a writer first. And I also want to be able to sort the internal array using the default comparer. That's an important criteria for my collection. The sample project includes the Writers class that adds these capabilities. Let's look at it and see how it works. Let's test our custom collection class by choosing option K. Here, I'm going to create a new instance of a class named Writers. Where is Writers? There it is. Writers is a class that inherits from collection of writer. Collection came from system.collections.objectModel. Okay, now in this class, we're going to attempt to save the data. In order to save it, we have to make the class serializable. We're using functionality we haven't really talked much about, well, never, but in order to serialize or save the contents of this class, we have to add the serializable attribute to the class itself. This serializable attribute is really part of the name of the class, so it's really appearing like this, but because it's easier to read, I usually break it up into two lines. This class inherits from the base collection class of writer, and I need to add some functionality. I want to add the capability to add a writer. Now, by default, the collection class has an add method. It lets you add a writer. Well, I want to make it so you can add a writer given the name in the home state, which means you pass in two strings and I will create the new writer and add it to the internal collection, which is named items. So this allows you two ways to add a writer to this collection. Either create the writer yourself or pass me name and home state and I'll add them. Okay, the items collection inside this class, which we're using to store items in, it's really just an I list. It's not a collection. So if we want to sort it, doesn't have a sort method, we're going to need to cast it as the correct kind of thing. I've used the direct cast operator here. The direct cast operator is much like C-type if you haven't seen it, except that it will not do any conversion. It just treats the object as if it was a different kind of object. 
If it can't perform that, it will raise an exception. It doesn't attempt to convert data. It just treats the reference as a different kind of reference. It's a little more efficient. So items is an I list. I'm going to cast it as a list of writer. Once I've done that, I can sort it. Otherwise, this collection won't have a sort method. So this is how you can implement your own sort method. The only thing we have left to do is a way to save and restore this content. I've provided a save method. The way this save method works is a little beyond the scope of this course, but I'll quickly describe it. The save method allows me to specify a file name. I'm going to create a file stream object using that file name, specifying that I want it to be in create mode. So I have a file stream ready to go. In order to perform the saving of this contents, I need some way to convert it into a binary stream so I can shove it out to the file. The way we do that is by using a binary formatter object, which comes from the system.runtime.serialization.formatters.binary namespace. There's a good reason to use an import statement if there ever was one. I'll create a new instance of that class. It has a serialize method. You tell it where to serialize and what to serialize. And it goes whoop and saves it out to that location for you. OK, that's how we save the contents. To retrieve the contents back, I need a shared method named load. You can't create an instance method because you don't have an instance yet. So I have a shared function named load, which returns back for me an instance of the writer's class. I give it a file name. It hands me back a writer's instance. I put this inside a try catch block because it's quite likely you'll give me a file name that doesn't exist or it won't contain what I want. Some other error will occur. So how does this work? Again, I create a new file stream using the file name you specify, but open mode this time. I'll create that binary formatter again, and this time I'll call the deserialize method. I'll read the information from that file stream. What it hands back to me is an object. I need to cast it as the correct kind of thing, so I'll use the direct cast operator to cast it as a writer's object. I store that into my variable, and if nothing went wrong, I return that value back. If something goes wrong, I'm going to throw the exception out, let the caller deal with it. And that's the class. That's all there is to it. It all works because I've inherited from this base collection class, which handles everything that I don't handle here. I've added my own add method. I've added a sort method. I've added the ability to save and load an instance of this class. Let's go back to our sample and see how it's working. We create an instance of that class. I'm going to now call my special add method, which allows me to add new writers given their name and their state. I don't create the writer. I'll let them do it. There we go. I'm stepping through that. And of course, you can always create the writer yourself if you want and add that in because the collection base class automatically provides an add method, which allows you to add an instance of the type you're storing in the collection. OK. Now, the collection class doesn't provide a sort method, but this one does because we added it. OK. I'd like to display the original list. Let's do that. The original list right now, there's my list. Since it implements I enumerable, I could just display the contents, calling the toString method of each item. I'm going to change some elements. Well, first of all, I can refer to an element by its index. The collection base class does that for me. I didn't have to do anything to make that happen. I'm going to call the save method to save the contents of the class in its current state down the disk. If I go look at my C drive right now, I would have a file, c colon writers.dat. Now I'm going to attempt to reload it. Now I could, of course, have gone away, come back another day, and reload it. But you'll believe me. I'm going to load this into a new collection named new writers. Same effect. And finally, oh, notice, by the way, I call it based on the writers class. It's a shared method, so I say writers.load not some specific instance.load. Now I'll call the display list method displaying the, oops, wrong collection. Wouldn't prove a thing. I don't want to display my writers. I want to display new writers. Isn't edit and continue a wonderful thing? All right, so now I'll display the contents of new writers, which is a newly loaded from disk version of my saved file. 
of my saved class. And now when I display that, you'll see that we get the value that was after saving and loading. Of course, we can always go out to the disk and look at it. And I can open that, oh, send a notepad or something. Let's try opening with notepad. There's notepad. And the contents are all here. It's a bunch of binary goo, but if we scroll through, you'll see. There we are. Andy, New York, Brian, CA, Ken, CA, and so on. All the stuff is there. There's binary stuff making it look ugly, but we have managed to save the contents of our class out to disk, and that was our original goal.